once again, it's just a delight and privilege to be present with you as we worship God in spirit and in truth, and as we open up His Word to study from it, glean from the Scriptures the things we need to be doing in our lives to please Him, to glorify His name. I'm appreciative of the hymns we sang that point out our need to follow the Lord, to have the decision made to render obedience to His will, to follow Him in all things, and to give Him the glory in our lives. And as we think about this idea of decisions and Again, kind of focusing upon the concept of God-centeredness, the need to be God-centered, and all the different facets of that. Uh, and as we talked about, the idea that everything can really be boiled down to either being God-centered or man-focused. And our desire and our aim is to be God-centered rather than man-focused. And when we think about this, this also involves our decisions, the very decision we make to become a child of God. At the close of our service, we're going to offer an invitation to render obedience to the Lord for any that are present who have yet to obey the plan of salvation upon belief, repentance, and confession that one submits into baptism, immersed in water to be raised to walk in newness of life. There's no greater decision we can make in life. You can think about the various decisions that we have, the various uh, times in which we have to go and uh, reflect upon the direction we go in life, and the two greatest decisions we make is First and foremost, to render obedience to the Lord, to become a child of God. Secondly, the marriage, choosing our mates, our spouses, who will go hand in hand with us through life. And then we make a whole bunch of other decisions in life. Many of the decisions we make come as just a natural course of events. Uh, you might think about it from this perspective of the idea that in the, what time are you going to get up in the morning? I think most of you know what time you're going to get up. Uh, you've already kind of decided that. It, it doesn't take a lot to kind of come to that understanding of what I'm going to do in order to be able to accommodate my time frame. Uh, I'm, I'm going to work. I know what time I'm supposed to be at work. I know what I'm going to do to get up, to get ready, prepare, eat some breakfast. I know how long it'll take me to drive to work. And so I'm going to want to be there on time. And so I know what time I need to get up in order to accomplish that goal, to be on work on time. A lot of decisions are like that. We, we don't give a lot of thought. Uh, it doesn't require a great deal in order to make those kinds of decisions. We make hundreds if not thousands of decisions all the time along those lines. In fact, I'm kind of persuaded that one reason why we're creatures of habit is because it's just simpler that way. You know, we're comfortable with that and we've made these decisions and we just kind of follow that pattern. Well, the decisions we're going to think about additionally this evening, we're going to reflect on it from the standpoint of the church and our personal decisions. How to make decisions. Uh, that's what really is going to be the aim. And what we want to kind of re to look at and, and give some thoughtful consideration from God's holy and divine word. How to make decisions. Again, most decisions are easy, but there are decisions that we need to ponder carefully. And the scriptures actually provide us with a formula for making these decisions. There's a scriptural process for decision making. And as we go through this, then we note, first of all, has God legislated? We ask this question. If he's legislated on the matter, we must do that. We can't compromise it. It's been decided for us. All we need to do is ascertain what it is so we can do it and live it and adhere to it. So God legislates matters, and therefore the decision is made for us. We are going to go and pursue that course of action. There is then the next question, and really going to be more the focal point of our thought this evening. What is in the best interest of the church? And this falls in the area of judgment and opinion. There's going to be judgment that's going to be rendered. We're going to have opinions associated with this idea of trying to go about and make these types of determinations. Now, let me kind of illustrate it this way. And I'm going to do so by using something that we can all relate to very readily. Uh, something that we can understand in order to kind of demonstrate the process itself. We find that the scriptures tell us that we are to assemble on the first day of the week. There are worshipful activities we engage in. Acts the 20th chapter in verse 7. Disciples came together upon the first day of the week to break bread. Paul preached to them. You can go over to 1 Corinthians 16, the first two verses, where it talks about laying by and storage you prosper on the first day of the week. The first day of the week is when that's to be done. So we're to assemble on the first day of the week. Now that's been decided for us because the Lord has determined that that's the occasion, one occasion at least that has been stipulated and mandated in God's word, that we are to meet on the first day to worship Him. And so that's taken out of our hands. We simply humbly submit. I, uh, in my part of the country, there's, you go down the streets and there's a church and they advertise that they have a service on Saturday night. 
If it's inconvenient for you to come on Sunday when they have their other services, you can come on Saturday night. And they also have this expression that accompanies that idea of coming on Saturday night, come as you are. Now, I'm not exactly sure what that means. Of course, I, I know that they just come, come on in. We don't care. You come in any way that you're dressed and whatever the arrangement, you just drop in on us. Come as you are, and this is for your convenience. And so we're going to make this provision for you. And so some people decide that they're going to go on Saturday night, and this group determined, this denomination, that they're going to make provisions for people who want to come Saturday as opposed to Sunday, the first day of the week. So we'll make provisions for the seventh day as opposed to the first day of the week. Now, they're in violation of the instructions of our Lord, and those who are going to honor Him are going to submit to Him. Now, think about this other part of the situation. Okay, on the first day of the week, we're all in agreement that that has been mandated. We're to do that. So now, when are we going to do that on the first day of the week? What time are we going to assemble? We have to have some order, some structure. We have to know when we're going to come together. So there's a determination that's made as to the time when we are to assemble. At some point, there's a decision that is rendered. And then that's when we come. That's, that's the time in which we assemble. So we are not to forsake the assembly. We are to come to the assembly. The decisions made as to that time on the first day of the week. Now, that's opinion and judgment. It can vary. People can look at it. But some determination has to be made in order for us to fulfill the command to assemble, right? So with those kind of thoughts in mind, I want to develop this a little bit more extensively. Uh, delve into it a little bit more in order to kind of think about it in a, in a way to help us appreciate the decision-making process. Back in the day, that's the way I would approach it. You know, you have the two parts. You've got what the Lord has mandated. You've got that part which He permits and allows, and we have to decide about it. And that part in which we have to decide how this decision is going to be made. And, I, and it's in the best interest of the church. And I think that does expressly set forth what is right, but I don't believe that it fully helps us understand what that means or requires. And so let's consider this together a little bit more extensively. Though we are to submit to one another, and you think about there in 1 Peter 5, 5, where, where it describes that. Be submissive to one to another. And the idea is yielding one to the other. There comes a point when a decision is made, and we have to yield. The, no, we're not going to necessarily all agree. Obviously, there's going to be different views. People kind of have different ideas about what time would be a good time to meet, what would be most convenient. But the decision has to be made, and so once the decision is made, we submit, we yield. And we're to yield to one another. Now, let me say that yielding does not mean that it's a majority rule, that it, it's going to be the most influential or the loudest voices. That's not going to be the determining factor. Now, all of those may be involved, and that doesn't mean that because it's the majority that we're not going to do it. It's not saying that because one's influential that they're not going to have any say in the matter. And the idea of the loudest voice, somebody speaking up because they're passionate about something, well, that's certainly going to have to be taken into account. But my point here is that as we think about it, what, what's really going to have to be the basis of our determination, when we think about what's in the best interest of the church, we're going to have to evaluate it, not by just what some want or what some desire, or even what the majority may feel about a matter. And if you look at James, the fourth chapter, verse 2, and that kind of... <coughs> brings our attention to this point of the wrongful way in which people look at these matters and kind of are going to approach it and have the disposition. And uh, that verse really kind of is the basis for backing up into the third chapter. But it says, You lust and do not have, you murder and covet and cannot obtain. It's talking about the wrongful attitude and improper disposition of hearts. You fight in war. Now, if you back up to verse uh, 14 of the third chapter, that's kind of after having laid this idea before us of the wrong attitude. Now look at this with me in verse 14. But, you have, but if you have bitter envy, self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above. It's earthly, sensual, demonic. For whereas envy, self-seeking exists, confusion and every evil thing are there. That's the wrongful disposition. And, and sometimes decisions are rendered on the basis of these types of things and people wanting to have their way, they're going to have this adamant disposition of saying this has got to be my way or the highway type of attitude. And that's the opposite of being submissive to one another, yielding to one another. And, and this type of wisdom that's described here is an earthly wisdom that creates all kinds of confusion and difficulties. It's disruptive. 
divisive. All those things are observable. Verse 17 picks up, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield. There's our idea expressed there, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So the idea of peace, the absence of hostility and warring, uh, is that idea of getting along, working together, accomplishing things together, and having that right disposition. And so we find in Philippians, the second chapter, an elaboration, if you will, by looking at these verses with this idea that's found here in James, the third chapter, where you have the wrongful disposition and wrongful attitude contrasted with what is right, and then as one looks at what's right, we see more of what is involved in that as Paul writes to the Philippian brethren. In verse 3 of the second chapter, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out, not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Here then is the right attitude. It's not just what I want, what I desire, but I care about you, and I want to see what's going to be best for you. I, I want to take that into account when we're looking at the various determinations we have to make from a perspective of decisions we have to do in order to accomplish the work the Lord has given us to do. There's these areas that have to be done. And, and in order to do this then, when I'm going about and when we're evaluating these things, I, I want to take into account your needs, what's happening with you, what, what, what is going to impact you, and if it adversely impacts you, then I want to reconsider that. We, we need to reflect on it from that perspective because there are these areas of judgment and opinion that have to be looked at and decisions are rendered. I know that serving not just as a preacher where I'm at, but also as an elder. I know as an elder you've got these decisions that come before you and you look at it. Of course, if the Lord's mandated, he's told it, that, that makes it easy. In fact, I prefer that. That's a lot simpler. The Lord says it, we do this. Anybody says, well, here's what it says. Here's why we do it. Here's what we're going to follow. That, that makes it pretty simple. Then you get these other kinds of decisions that have to be made. People have varying views. Uh, get to talking about it. I know at the congregation there at West Side in Wichita, we've had some discussions about the af uh, afternoon or evening service. That was an ongoing thing that's been looked at for us and talked about and and, and different ideas and different thoughts are looked at and had to be considered and reflected upon. Before we had elders, we went through a process in order to kind of get an idea of what might be best and most workable. We went through that process to, to, to give thoughtful consideration to it. So when we talk about what's in the best interest of the church, well, then we start looking at, okay, let's look at these brethren and how this impacts them. What's going to be the effect upon certain ones? And you know, if it's inconvenient for me, but it adversely impacts them, maybe I need to take a better look at this thing and have your best interest at heart. What is going to serve you and not just what I want? I use that illustratively again because I know that that's something that comes up. It's still the first day of the week and we're deciding when we're going to meet and on what, what time frames we're going to get together, what's going to take place in regard to those things. See, here's the key. When I say in what's in the best interest of the church, like I said, I felt like through the years when I've said that, that maybe I hadn't really carried it to the point of explaining what that means. What does it mean to be in the best interest of the church? Rather, what strengthens the church spiritually. So that becomes the determining factor. Does this strengthen the church spiritually? There may be instances where it's somewhat neutral. But many times it's not. Many times there's more involved in that. Many times you can start reflecting on it and seeing, is this going to make us stronger or is it really going to detract from what we are trying to accomplish? Is it going to help us be what we should be? You can look at a number of verses that I would just make reference to to sort of underscore this idea. So that in Acts the ninth chapter, and there in verse 31, it just simply says the churches throughout all Judea, and Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified that edified being built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. And I just use that verse sort of to capsulize the idea of thinking about edifying or being built up and what's going to be in the best interest of the church. That is what makes us stronger spiritually, makes us more Christ-like, more God-centered. And so if we're going to think about that, then that's always going to be part of the equation. And, and so we start looking at these matters and we have these decisions to be made so 
we think about it from the standpoint, is this really going to be helpful to us as a group, as a whole, and strengthen us? In the sixth chapter, and I'll just make a reference to this, I know you're acquainted with those verses, where there was a problem that had risen in the Jerusalem church. There were the Grecian widows that had not been taken care of properly. They felt that they had been neglected. And so they determined, the apostles by the Holy Spirit, that they were going to take care of this matter. So they instructed the church to look out from among them and choose seven men. They gave those qualifications that would be needful on that occasion to have these men to render this service to be able to see that these needs were met for these Grecian widows. And it pleased the whole church. And, of course, again, the Holy Spirit directed and guided how this thing was to be done. We see a great deal of wisdom associated with this. You know, the apostles, just as a, as a thought, as it relates to what we find here, the apostles had those spiritual gifts. Among the spiritual gifts was the discerning of spirits. They, they could know what was in the hearts of men, their minds. They, they were able to discern this because that was one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. If you look at, from a historical perspective of the Lord's church, there's never been a case, an occasion, going back to this point, since that time of the first century, when you had the apostles, there's never been a time in which there weren't individuals who were better equipped to make the decision to choose the seven men than the apostles. They could have done it very easily. They could have looked out and said, you, 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 and you, and they would have picked the very best man. The wisdom that we see there is that the church did this, and the apostles' part was to ensure that it was done by the qualifications being met. They certainly chose men that met those qualifications. Stephen and Philip, for example, are listed there in that number. But what it showed and demonstrated was the confidence of the brethren in these individuals that they met these qualifications, and therefore they were reassured that the fulfillment of their duty was going to be achieved because that confidence that existed there. The church was then brought into it, and participated in it, and thus had confidence in it. And I think we see the wisdom of it. We see the wisdom associated with this idea. The apostles, by the direction of the Holy Spirit, gave the instructions as to what was to be done for this, those to be selected, what was needful. The seven were to be picked out, and some means was used in order for the church to express their desire on that matter. And those were fulfilled. So what strengthens the church? It, the church grew. It, it, it was wisdom that was observable as it related to the implementation of this particular approach. When you go to 1 Corinthians 14th chapter and verse 12 and verse 26, we've had occasion through our study to refer to 1 Corinthians 14. It just strikes me that that's such a good verse because it's dealing with the assembly. It's dealing with the assembly in a way that describes edif being edified and being built up and how that's to be achieved. And the 12th verse and the 26th verse also then makes a reference to this idea that, that pertains to uh, the edification that's observable and, and noted. And the latter part just simply says, let it be for the edification of the church that you excel. In verse 26, at the conclusion of that, let all things be done for edification. Now, I understand that it had to do with worship principally and the proper use of these spiritual gifts that existed solely in the first century period of time before the written word. But that principle is also applicable to every area as it relates to the church to be edified, to be built up, and that includes the decision-making process. And I'm somewhat concerned by some trends that I observe. That, that this, these decisions and how these decisions are made, and part of what occurs is the opposite of what we're describing, which has to do with the spiritual strengthening of the church. And there tends to be, at least from my perspective, kind of appealing to and catering the spiritual weak and those individuals that are not really trying to be what they ought to be in the Lord's kingdom. They appeal to that spiritual lowest common denominator. I know that there are instances and situations in which people begin to talk about some matters and they say, you know, we meet, you know, at this time and, and here the Lord's mandated this so we're going to do that. But, you know, we just don't have people that are coming to the Bible classes. Now, the Bible class is part of the work of the church. We authorize it in Scripture because it's the work of the church in order to communicate God's Word, to teach it. We set it up in a way that we feel is a good organizational arrangement, which takes into account the different uh, developmental areas of these individuals who are being taught, the students. 
And so we, we look at this and we set this thing up with the idea of, of teaching God's word so we can be strengthened and built up. And so, well, it kind of, well, you know, people just don't come to these. And, and you start thinking about that situation, and I don't know anybody that wants to get rid of the Bible classes because people aren't attending. I haven't heard that yet. But I'm just using that illustratively. Well, you know, people aren't doing it. Well, what's the problem? The problem is people that don't avail themselves to come in order to be strengthened spiritually. Gospel meetings. You're having this gospel meeting. It's been very pleasant for me. I've been very appreciative of the kindnesses that have been extended and, and the comments that have been made. I appreciate your presence and coming. But, you know, there's this attitude that's around that, you know, gospel meetings, people just don't come to gospel meetings. Maybe we ought to just dispense with them. Or, or, and I have nothing against, incidentally, and I'm making these illustrations, I have nothing against a weekend meeting. And that's not my point. But when we start to go along and we start saying, well, just the weekend meetings because people don't come the rest of the week. So what are we accommodating? That's my concern. What's the mindset that you start seeing when this type of disposition is set forth? You know, we begin to look to see what, le as we go through these things, people don't do so, they're doing less, and so we need to take care of that, and so less and less is accomplished. This, instead of encouraging spirituality, it actually dampens that whole approach. And so my appeal is for us to think in regard to what is going to build us up. And people that aren't doing what we need to do is encourage them to do. Where I'm at, and I uh, have the same uh, situations and challenges that other places have. And Sunday evenings, you know, we have those who don't come back for various reasons, some legitimately. Others, well, it's just they they live awful ways, and I understand there's some challenges to coming back, and there's certain matters associated with that, but they, they kind of make decisions, so some of our number is down for Sunday evening. And so maybe, well, maybe the solution to that is, well, let's just get rid of Sunday evening. I mean, just, just totally eliminate that, and then we just won't have that type of situation, and that takes care of that matter. But my concern is that instead of helping people grow spiritually, that it actually is catering to a wrong disposition and attitude in regard to that. And this is not trying to just choose what various congregations have to do, what their circumstances are. They vary. There are certainly things that are legitimate as it relates to those kinds of decisions that have to be rendered. And, and it can vary because of circumstances in various areas and the churches having to look at those matters. I'm just saying about the principle. Does it spiritually enhance us? Does it cause us to grow? Is it something that's going to, to help us achieve our ultimate goal to be more God-centered? and more Christ-like? Or is it going to have the opposite effect? And that's the kind of question we need to ask before any decision is made. To kind of reflect upon those things and to be aware of it. Now, that's the congregational consideration. I want to look now at the personal decisions. Again, you think about this. There's personal decisions we're going to make, and there's a spiritual process. Now, I don't think you're going to be surprised by the scriptural process uh, as we look at this. And it may look very similar to what we just considered because has God legislated? Same thing with me personally in my life. God legislates. He, he informs me. Forsake not the assembling of ourselves together the manner of some is. Well, I'm not to forsake the assembly. He's legislated that. That's a command to me. I'm to obey that. I'm not at liberty to alter or change that. I'm supposed to humbly submit to that. And then we have the same thought when it comes to what's in the best interest of the myself, the person, and family. You think about what's in the best interest of the family and, and decisions I make. How does it impact me? And what does it do to the, my family when I'm making those kinds of determinations? And as those decisions are made and talk about this, again, God legislates, it's mandated, we follow that. There's other things in which I have some liberties in order to be, judgment is to be utilized in regard to those things. And so now I'm going to have to kind of go through this process. So what's that process? Well, that process, again, what strengthens the person, the family, spiritually? What's going to make me stronger? Again, God-centered. You're familiar with Joshua 24, 15. Now, sometimes I get myself in trouble, just as an aside. I start trying to talk about some of these things, and, you know, knitting and crocheting. And that kind of thing, and I, I'm not really knowledgeable about that. So I've had a tendency sometimes to talk about certain items. You go in, the people have crocheted or knitted or whatever they've done in order to have that thing where it says, 
You know, it's for me and my house. We'll serve the Lord. And there have been times I've been talking about something like that, and I look out in the audience, and some of the ladies are smiling at me because I've obviously gotten it wrong about what that is that they've done, and the stitching that's done. But you've all seen that, haven't you? You've seen some uh, types of plaques in which people have gone through and they kind of set that thing up. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And, and the reason that's prominent, and you kind of take that out, is because it really is the essence of the idea that moves us in our determinations and decisions, what we're going to do. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Joshua got before the Israelites of his day toward the end of his life. And we go through that part of it and we start seeing that Joshua was appealing to them. And he said, you have choice. He says, the choice is this. You can go and serve those idols, gods with the little g, the idols that was back there in Egypt from which you left, or you go in and serve the gods, these idols, that are here in Canaan. You can do that. You can make that choice. You can choose to do that. You know, that's everybody is going to have to render accountability. Everybody has these determinations that they make and decisions that they render. And you go through this thing, and he's laying before them this decision, a choice. And so once he stated before them that part of it, or you can serve the God of heaven, Jehovah God. You can serve him. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And when he made that appeal... Of course, he was going to stand by that, regardless of what else anyone does. Well, that generation was faithful to the Lord because of Joshua's influence. And those that followed after that, who were leaders because of Joshua, it talks about how they also were obedient to the Lord and followed Him and chose to serve Him. And that next generation down the line started going further away from God. You know, they started drifting away. But Joshua set forth the principle, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And what does that mean? That means I make decisions, and we're to make decisions that are going to be God-centered in our lives. Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. What that means is that the fathers have the duty and obligation, and we made reference to this on Sunday when looking at some matters pertaining to the idea of our lives being God-centered and you look at all that aspect that's associated with this and that when we come to the family structure as we talked about then on Monday night in the family that the head of the house is the husband the father he's the head of the household God gave him that duty and responsibility and obligation and so fathers, you have the obligation and duty to ensure that the children are being educated scripturally, biblically. And you want to bring them up in that nurture, training them, teaching them, instructing them, guiding them in the knowledge of the Word. Because what we want to instill in them is an understanding of God's Word so that they know what to do and how to live their lives correctly and rightly. So the decisions are made with that in mind. What's going, to, what's going to help my children? If I miss services because I make choices not to be there, let me tell you something, fathers. Making that choice and that decision doesn't just adversely affect you. It has an adverse effect upon your children. They're not present when they need to be present. They're not being shown in the kind of influence that you should have upon them to say... The Lord is the most important thing in my life. You know, there are people who make all kinds of plans, and I'm kind of one of these people that are this planner. Uh, Nathan and I have been talking a little bit about Gettysburg. He and family, they, some of the family went to Gettysburg, and uh, hopefully, Lord willing, going to go this summer. I haven't been to Gettysburg, kind of have an interest in history and the Civil War. So we were talking about that so that I can get a heads up. What, what things I want to be sure to do to avail myself. And so my wife and I and our youngest son, he's going to accompany us, and we're going to, going to go to Gettysburg. And so I, I'm kind of a planner, and, and I go through and I, I, I plan all the different things I want to, to be sure to accomplish, when I'm going to be where. And, you know, the first thing on the agenda is where will I attend service? If I'm going to be someplace on Sunday, where am I going to attend? If I'm going to be someplace Wednesday night, where am I going to attend? Um, Joe and Letha, and at that time their boys being younger, my wife Nancy and I 
with our three children, all young, we did that Mickey Mouse thing. Went over there to Florida. You know, got, and and we, we did that. We, we met them over there to go out to the parks and Epcot, Magic Kingdom, do those kinds of things. And I've always enjoyed and appreciate traveling with them. We've done that on other occasions like Washington, D.C. And, and the reason I enjoy that is because I don't have to wonder what they're also prioritizing in their life because they're also looking at where we're going to attend services, and we're lo I'm looking at that, and so we kind of compare notes, and we make the decision where we're going to attend services. And when the time comes, and we're in, out in the park, and it's a Wednesday night, and it's getting kind of late, we, we have enough time, we make sure we have enough time to get back so we can go to Bible study at the congregation where we're going to go attend. And, you know, the reason we do that it's because we want to. Now, I want my children to understand that, but you know something? It's not a conscious determination. That I want my children to recognize this. It's because we want to do that. We make sure we do that. Our children see that, and that's an outcome of our behavior and conduct. Do you realize that, by and large, we do what we want to do? There may be exceptions to that. In fact, I know there are. There are instances and occasions when that can't be the case, but by and large, we do what we want to do. When I, some of y'all were probably aware of North Shore, it doesn't exist any longer. They merged with Greens Bio at that time, and I, they ended up going elsewhere. But I preached. My first place where I preached full time was at North Shore, and I did so for uh, se several years, uh, not quite three, when I was over there. And uh, I'm a big football fan. I enjoy football. I really like it. It, it, it. It's something that I kind of like to follow the football teams. I've got certain teams I follow. I like pro football. I like college football. My wife says that there's a football game on. I don't even have to know who's out there. I'm just going to watch it. And I talked about, you know, at the time, the Houston Oilers, which, again, they're, they've gone off, you know, now you have a different team. They went over to Tennessee and all that kind of situation. But the Houston Oilers, Houston Oilers were pretty good for a while there. And so the Houston Oilers, and there was a point in which it looked like they might make the Super Bowl. And there was a man, and uh, I thought initially he was joking, but I kind of concluded later that probably he was telling more along the lines of the reality of the situation. He says, you know, Mike, if the Houston Oilers are in the Super Bowl, I won't be at services that Sunday night. And I kind of laughed it off a little bit. And later, as I got to know him a little bit better, I decided he was just, that's what he was telling me. Now, I love football, but, you know, I was going to be there on Sunday night, the Houston Oilers playing or not, didn't matter. And I told some people, you know, if I was on my deathbed and there was the Super Bowl, I'm fearful that somebody's going to take that the wrong way. I'd just have them carry me there to the services so I'd, I'd be there. So nobody would think I'm staying home to watch the Super Bowl. As much as I enjoy it, that's not the point. What's our priority? What's the most important thing to us? <coughs> What is it that we see? There's a lot of things that are enjoyable. That's fine in their place, but they don't take a precedent over serving the Lord. Anything that we put above the Lord puts Him in a secondary position. We can't, we can't do that. That's not right. That, nor should we desire to do that. What is it we would rather do? Come and worship with the saints in order to praise our Maker, our Creator, our God, to, to recognize the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer, to think and pray and, and reflect upon the Godhead and all that the God, God has done for us and to reflect upon the Word of God that the Holy Spirit revealed to us, God's mind given to us. What would we rather do than to worship Him and to praise His name and to edify and build up one another? What, what is there something that we care more about than that? In 2 Chronicles, the 11th chapter, verse 16, th this particular verse, and, and as you turn over there, let me give you the setting. This was the time of the divided kingdom. And you'll recall in your biblical history, the Old Testament, as you have the time in which Rehoboam ascended to the throne, that there were those who... Israelites, 
that did not like all of the taxation and the being oppressed in that way and respect. And so they made an appeal to Rehoboam to make their burdens lighter. The older ones who were counselors gave the instructions to Rehoboam, you need to do that and they'll follow you. The younger men told Rehoboam, you make it harder. What your father Solomon did, you're going to increase their burden. And so Rehoboam listened to the younger one's counsel. He made that statement and as a result, he had ten of the tribes that went off under Jeroboam. And, and so you had a division, that's the divided kingdom, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, Jeroboam, even though God had told him that this was the way it was going to be and that he would be over these tribes and reassured him about those matters, Jeroboam was fearful that if the Jews there in the northern kingdom made their way down to worship at the temple in Jerusalem, which was in Judah, that their loyalties would return back to Rehoboam. So as a consequence of this, Jeroboam had a bright idea. He, he came up with a scheme, and this scheme was to keep the people there in the northern kingdom of Israel when they worshipped. So he set up these golden calves, one in Dan and one in Bethel, strategically located for the people so that they could go there conveniently. And that's, in fact, what he told him, I'm doing this for you. Now, the ulterior motives was it really wasn't for them at all, it was for him. But that's not what he appealed to. He appealed to them from a standpoint of making things simpler and easier and more convenient for you. And he also took then out of the tribes and selected priests. And of course the law, the Mosaic law, said that priests had to come exclusively from the tribe of Levi. And so that was the situation. And that's what took place. In fact, from that point on, the northern kingdom of Israel was always involved in idolatry. There were no good kings in the northern kingdom. Some were more evil than others, but none of them were good. They all were idolaters, and the people pursued that course as a whole. Now, not everybody, not all those in the north, though, went and engaged in idolatry. They did something different. And that's what you find in 2 Corinthians 11th chapter and there in verse 16. And after the Levites, if you back up, the Levites left. They came down. They, they, they saw that as wrong. They went down to the southern kingdom where they could participate correctly in the activities that they were to engage in as, as the priests. So, so you have the, the situation. And after the Levites, those from all the tribes of Israel, such as set their heart to seek the Lord God of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice to the Lord God of their fathers. There's a migration. And the migration was this. There were people who left their homes, were uprooted, and they journeyed to the southern kingdom of Judah so that they could serve God faithfully. They were God-centered. Do you know that they left their heritage? You know when, the, when it was divided up and all the tribes received their part of it and then, the, then it kind of came down, down to the families and the families had their land that was designated for them? They left their heritage, their homes, and they went down to the southern kingdom of Judah so they could worship God rightly. You know how inconvenient that was? What kind of sacrifice was involved in that? How uprooting the family and taking yourself from other family members in order to do that? Do you realize the challenge associated with that? But they did it because they're God-centered and let me tell you something, by that choice, they took the families with them and they took them into a, a place in which they could worship rightly and correctly and appropriately. You know, I, I do think, and, and you look at the kind of sacrifice here, I, I think sometimes, brethren, we, we're spoiled. And, and when I say we, I mean me included. I'm not exempting myself in any way. We are truly, genuinely spoiled. Because I think we get to the point where we feel that an inconvenience is a sacrifice. You know, the inconvenience becomes a sacrifice. I have to do some things, and it, it's kind of sort of inconvenient for me, and so we have to do this thing. We, we get it in our cars that are air-conditioned, and we drive to an air-conditioned building and sit in padded pews or whatever the arrangements are, and, and, and this comfortable, and somehow that's a great sacrifice that we have to go because we have to travel a number of miles. 
You know how blessed we are? I know intellectually sometimes we sort of, oh yes, I, I know. Do we genuinely understand how blessed we are? And, and what we have available to us. And yet complain that because things are, seem to be difficult. I, I, have to, I have to get up, I have to go, I have to do this type of situation. Instead of delighting in it, we kind of feel like we're put upon. These Jews, uprooted from their home, went in order to serve God faithfully. You know, there are decisions that are made in regard to these things. Some of these decisions, people decide to move someplace because they get a better job. By a better job, more pay. Nothing wrong with that. Don't discount that at all. But when we're making that kind of decision, do we take into account whether there's a congregation of the Lord's people in that area? I got a call sometime back. There was a, some folks from a, a congregation over there in uh, east of us uh, in Missouri. Uh, this, this family was looking to make a move, and they were looking to make a move in a part of Kansas, and they were wanting to find out about the church there. And I said, there is no church there doesn't exist. He's, he's looking because he's got an opportunity for a job that he would really like to have. <gasps> Met better pay. It was a promotion. It's a good opportunity for him. And so in the conversation, there was no church there. And told him that, that you could go out to that, that place. And he's going to take his family and go there. And he's going to be in an isolated place without any help or support. And I found out from some other people later on that this individual really wasn't spiritually strong like he should be. Now, I understand that Acts 8 and verse 4, they went everywhere and they preached the Word. So there, there may be an occasion where somebody can go and help plant the seed and, and water there and, and, and a congregation be established. But that's the exception to the rule, what I found, discovered. So when we make our decisions, what are the most important things? When you start looking at those kinds of opportunities that we look from a physical standpoint, is it going to create something from a spiritual standpoint that's not going to be what I ought to be? And, and, and I need to think about that and look at that and weigh that and evaluate that for that God-centeredness. Because we know individuals, and I'm sure Jerry has too, that kind of got themselves in predicaments such as that because they had their eye on the physical and neglected the spiritual. That that type of thing and situation can happen. And we shouldn't let that happen to us by being God-centered and, and, being one, and having that desire to do His will in our lives. So those are the kinds of things we need to be aware of and evaluate. We must know the Scriptures. If I'm going to be able to make the right decisions, I've got to know God's Word. I mean, I recognize that what's mandated, what we already talked about, what he's already stated before us has to be done, then I have to know that part. But even those areas of opinion and judgment, when I'm going to try to make determinations, and I'm going to look at the various options I have, and I want to make the determination based upon what's going to make me stronger spiritually, not weaken me, then that also requires knowledge of God's Word. So you think about First Peter, verses 1 and 2, after talking about what we discard, that then... It talks about, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. How am I going to grow spiritually? As a babe in Christ, I, I'm going to take the milk of the Word. It uses the analogy of a, of a child, a, a baby, and we all know and understand that. It, it's easily understood what the point is being made. A baby has to have milk. It can't eat solid food. It starts off with milk. The milk causes the child to be able to grow. So there's the milk of the Word. And that milk of the Word, we study it, we examine it, and it causes us to be able to grow spiritually like we should. And, and when we look further, we see that we shouldn't be content. We should grow to maturity. And in growing to that maturity, the consequence of that is then I can take on that meat. I can take on things that are more challenging and difficult through knowledge of His Word, and it enables me to make better choices. And that's the point of Hebrews chapter 5, at least the intended idea, even though they didn't follow it correctly. And so the inspired writer gave them a scathing rebuke of what they should have been, and if they'd follow this, this would be the consequence of it, instead of failing to know and to study and to grow as they ought. And if you read these verses with me, you'll see what I mean by the idea of making the right choices, that is, making decisions that cause us to be more spiritual. 
In verse 12, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. So milk is fine, but aren't we concerned if you have a baby and, uh, and, and now an adolescent, they're growing, and yet they can't eat solid food? All they can do is still take milk. We start becoming worried. We want to take them to the doctor. We want to find out what's wrong. Something's not right with that. We're concerned for them, and so we seek then the correct medical assistance to try to discover the problem so we can correct it. Well, this is a situation spiritually. When their milk was fine, but now they're coming to a point when they should have been maturing and they should be taking the solid food or the Word of God, and they weren't able to do it. You should, and instead of being teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. You have need for milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. That's fine for a baby, but not for one who should be mature. But solid food belongs to those who are full of age. That is, now notice, you're full of age, you're mature. And it describes then, because of your maturity, who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern good and evil. You can look at these things, you can ascertain what's good, what's evil. You can make the choices predicated upon that. You can see what's preferable, you can see what's going to grow, cause you to grow spiritually. You can see what's best for your family because you're looking at it from the view of God's desires and what He sees as the greatest needs we have. And we're going to adhere to that because that's being God-centered and spiritually strong. So I need to know God's Word. I, I have to look at it, examine it. It helps me make those determinations. When I ignore it, then I make my choices and based upon all kinds of other things and what men may have to say about a particular matter and the results of that is going to be catastrophic. It's going to be cause ruin and not going to be doing that which is going to be helpful to us to grow as we should. I want to talk just for a minute about the importance of prayer in decision making and the idea of prayer and decision making. But we are to pray in accord with His will. We find that over in John 5, 14. And that kind of transitions then from the idea of knowing His Word, studying His Word, so that I know how to pray and what I should pray for. And so that, that's the study of the Word. So, so prayer, the importance of prayer. In James' first chapter, in verse 5, if you like wisdom, then you ask God. He, he gives liberally. He desires us to have the wisdom. And wisdom is applied knowledge. You take the knowledge of God's Word and apply it correctly and appropriately. So the wisdom that we have, and of course that wisdom that comes from Him. And so we're looking then, and, and the importance of prayer in making decisions and determinations is that I pray with a proper understanding and correct uh, realization, and, and I'm praying for, to the Lord about matters in my life, and He hears our prayers. And the way He answers prayers is interesting. And sometimes our Pentecostal friends say we don't believe in prayer. And the reason they say that is because we don't believe miracles exist today because the scriptures go through and describe the purpose of miracles. That purpose no longer is needful. And in 1 Corinthians 13, when talking about spiritual gifts, we see that there's going to come a time when those spiritual gifts would cease. When that which is perfect has come, that perfect law of liberty. And we go through that study with them to show these miracles. And they say, well, if you don't believe in miracles, what's the point of praying? What does prayer do for you? How does prayer help you? Well, God answers prayer not just miraculously, but providentially. Miracles are using that which is supernatural outside of the realm of nature. Providence is God working and operating through the natural means and arrangement that He has. And so He's working. He continues to work today. And He works providentially. And when you turn over to the fifth chapter of James, we see a reference to this idea and the effectiveness of prayer. And it's not coincidental that He selects an example from the Old Testament that shows providence and work, God's providential workings, as opposed to the miraculous. And so if you pick up there in that reading with verse 16, confess your trespasses one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Now, the reference here is not to the occasion when Elijah met the prophets of Baal, and then they went through this process of calling upon God. First they called upon Baal, and they failed. And Elijah called upon God after he made all these preparations, and God sent fire from heaven and consumed it. That was miraculous. He used the example of Elijah praying. 
first for rain not to come and then for praying for rain. And if you go back to 1 Kings, the 18th chapter, you'll read about that incident. And Elijah was in prayer, and he's praying to God. And he sends his servant several times over to look out to see what's taking place. And finally the servant comes back and he says, there's a cloud about the hand the size of a fist out there on the sky. And Elijah said, okay, it's going to rain. Now you wouldn't know that this was answered to a prayer other than the fact that what's recorded here. It's revealed to us. And so because the clouds come, and how does rain come? We understand that. Here come the clouds, the clouds build up, and as a result of that, the rain falls. That's a natural occurrence, an event. But that rain came as a result of the prayer of Elijah. God providentially operating. A supernatural source operating in a natural means, in a natural way. So our prayers, He hears. He cares for us. We don't have revelation to tell us His answers at various times. But we know He cares and we know that He does answer our prayers. Sometimes it's yes, sometimes it's no, and sometimes it's wait. But He does care for us and we pray to Him and we trust Him to take care of these things. We rely upon Him to take care of these things. And just as an example of something of this providence and making decisions. I was talking to some individuals the other day and they were talking about how God speaks to them and how God has helped them make determination and they know His voice. <laughs> And so they're asking me about, don't I believe that? Because after all, as a preacher, am I being called? And how go to places? I said, well, I pray about making decisions and determinations. And when I'm going to make a decision, say, to go work with the congregation, I pray about it. But the Lord doesn't, I don't hear His voice. I, I make the determination based upon the information I have and looking at all these things, and, and I just pursue it. And they were kind of perplexed by that. They didn't understand that idea. And I said, well, I just, I just go about doing what the Lord expects of me. And so I had a a preacher, one time I heard him presenting a lesson and he talked about providence. Did a good job when he was referring to that part of his study as he was going through that matter. And he said that he was at a congregation he knew it was the providence of God that was at work because everything went so well. It's been a good work for him. And you know something? That well may have been the providence of God. I'm not denying that. But you know something else? A preacher may end up in a very hard, difficult work and that may be the providence of God as well. You know why I say that? Because you look, when God sent people to places in Revelation, times of Revelation, when He spoke to the prophets, He sent them into particular incidences, places and events that were very hard and challenging. You think about Elijah and, and what we see with Elijah and the work that Elijah did. You look at these other prophets, Elisha, and what he did. You think about Ezekiel. I've always thought about Ezekiel. You know, Ezekiel was the hard-headed prophet. He's a hard-headed preacher. You might know a few of those. He's a hard-headed preacher. What God said, I'm going to send you to the Jews in captivity there in Babylon. You're going to be part of that captivity. And I'm going to send you there. And those people have a hard head, but I'm going to give you a harder head than they have. Because God wanted them to hear the word. So providence may involve being sent into a situation that's not necessarily pleasant for us personally. But that's what the Lord wanted and required. So that providence, I can't determine providence on the basis of how it comes out for me personally. So how do I know about the providence of God and, and when it's working, I don't have to. It's not necessary. God's going to take care of that. I can have absolute reliance. God's going to take care of those things. He does everything perfectly, absolutely correctly, and I don't have to worry about that. You know what I need to do? It doesn't matter. Whatever situation I'm in, I just need to do what the Lord instructs me to do as He's given me His Word to guide my life. And when I do that, I'm pleasing Him. I don't have to know about the other matters. God will take care of His part of the thing. I'm too busy trying to take care of mine. And the decisions we make had better be God-centered, honoring Him and glorifying Him, and that which causes us to grow spiritually as we should, and ever be a part of going about being a light to the world around about us and encouragement to those that are lost out in the world and to build up our brethren in Christ. That's our work. Our act. And every Christian has a part to play in that. Every single solitary one of us is about that task. And one of the things, when we assemble and we see other brethren assemble, that's encouraging. Doesn't it encourage you? When you see the brothers and sisters and everybody get together and we're singing together, isn't that encouraging? Sometimes we think we have to do great things to be what we should be, and the reality is what we need to do is do what we can. We do what we should be doing. The Lord doesn't require things of us we cannot do but He requires us to do everything we're expected to do and can do and are capable of doing and we better be doing. 
So when we think about the decision, we think about these matters personally, as a congregation of the Lord's people, what is the basis of those decisions? Well, now we come back to where we started. That is the decision, this most important decision we make in life, is whether or not to obey the Lord. To hum humbly submit to His will. And as we're going to sing the song of encouragement, if you're present, we encourage you, invite you to come forward. If you've yet to be baptized for remission of sins, to humbly submit to His will so you can be immersed in water, to be raised to walk in that newness of life. So that you can have truly determined to follow and serve Him and please Him in your life. And if you've done that but you haven't lived as you should and there's something you missed, you need the prayers of the congregation. We also give you that opportunity now to make that request known as together we stay in the same.